Um, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Centre for Policy Studies and CapEx event space at Conservative Party Conference. We're here uh, with a full programme of events through Tuesday evening, so um, please do come back. We have agendas and uh, various CPS reports and bits of merchandise at the back, uh, all free to collect and take away. Uh, we don't want to have to return to London with them. Um, please also sign up for various newsletters uh, and so on so you can keep up to date with everything else that we're doing. Um, I'm Tom Plockerty. I'm the research director at the Centre for Policy Studies and our topic this afternoon uh, is whether the Bank of England is fit for purpose. Uh, I think when we do our sort of planning meetings for the conference program. Every year, probably for the last five or six, I've said, why don't we do something on monetary policy? That would be really interesting. And you always get these blank looks around the table. Um, and finally, we got it on the program, and this is actually a fairly full room. Um, I'd like to think it's me and the panel we've assembled. It's partly that, but of course, it's partly that monetary policy and inflation uh, have risen up the political agenda. They are live issues in a way that they haven't been, uh, perhaps, for quite a long time. Um, so we've got a great panel here to discuss the topic. Uh, speaking first, we will have Lord Frost, David Frost, uh, Chief Brexit Negotiator, a political advisor in the Foreign Office, uh, professional diplomat. He was ambassador to Denmark. Uh, he was also CEO of the Scotch Whiskey Association, which must seem like another life now, Indeed. I think. <laughs> David, thank you for joining us. Um, Gerard Lyons, uh, for almost three decades, one of our leading city economists. Uh, he has advised politicians, he's written for think tanks, he's even been talked about as a potential governor of the Bank of England, so I'll be very uh, interested to hear what he has to say. And immediately to my left we have Su Ping Chang, the Telegraph's economics editor. Uh, she's been covering the big stories in business, finance and economics for the last 15 years, mostly with the Telegraph, also with the BBC and The Motley Fool. Uh, so. That's that. We're going to start with some opening remarks from our panel up here. I'll try and steer the conversation for a little while after that, and then we'll leave ample time for questions from the floor uh, before we wrap up. So without further ado, David, would you like to kick us off? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you very much, Tom. Um, we've only got um, a few minutes, and there's so much to say on this subject. So let me just say uh, three or four things, perhaps, to, to kick off the debate. I think. I mean, the, the, I suppose there are two questions behind this. One is what the issue of independence of the bank, and second, has it been doing its job well, um, given the, the circumstances? Now, let me just sort of focus in on those. I think on the first point, my basic view is that central banks can never really be totally independent. I think it's a bit of a fallacy to think that an organisation that's fundamentally part of government can be totally independent. What they can be, of course, is um, independent, if you like, subcontractors for providing inflation fighting services uh, to a target and within an institutional framework that is set democratically. And I think under Eddie George and Mervyn King, that was what the bank did, and generally pretty well. Uh, I think it's shifted away from that more recently uh, for reasons I'll go into. I think the, the, the broader problem behind this is that um, because of a series of policy failures, central banks in the West in the West have gone well beyond the inflation providing, inflation fighting services role to being a major player in the economy as a whole. And obviously that's a problem if they are uh, supposedly independent with limited democratic legitimacy. Now I can go into to why that's the case. Uh, I'll, I'll just some touch on it now. But I think in short, uh, first of all, the, the undynamic uh, economy of the 70s and 80s established the Bundesbank model, the reputation of an inflation uh, fighting central bank. But by the time that model started to spread in the 90s and 2000s, the financial system had changed very considerably. It was much more dynamic, much more liberalized. 
and central banks made a series of mistakes on uh, monetary policy, starting with Greenspan in the mid-90s, that have produced this low inflation environment that we're, we're in now. And as a result of that, every, every interest rate decision they take is political as well as technical. Uh, every decision on monetary policy is political as well as technical, and that's how they've got into the, the difficulty they're in. I think over the last decade, the bank here has been, I think, particularly problematic. Uh, poor signalling to markets, the, the governor's own uh, visible interest in some interest, in subjects other than pure monetary policy, um, its association with some of the predictions around the Brexit referendum. Um, and uh, I think the more recently the Brexit taboo against criticizing independent institutions has come to be a problem for proper debate uh, around the bank and its role, and we saw that under Liz Truss. So what, what happens now? I mean, the bank is, I think, correct to review its models, uh, its track records, and it's good that there's a bit of outside scrutiny to that. But I think it is difficult to have honest discussions here until we get away from this suggestion that um, talking about independent institutions is sort of populist and illegitimate. We've, we've got to move away from that. And I think how well the bank, to, 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 to finish, I think how well the bank does its job now is really a function of how well the government does its job in future in running the economic, economic policy. If we can liberalize, um, deregulate, get growth going again in the economy, perhaps we've got a chance of getting off this low interest rate treadmill and uh, normalizing things that will make the conduct of monetary policy easier. If we can't, then I think the bank's task will come to be extremely difficult over time and we will have more and more government involvement in monetary policy as well as fiscal policy and the, the next financial crisis will be extremely difficult to manage whoever's in charge. So I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Gerard. Oh, uh, thank you. Well, I echo or agree with what Lord Frost has said. Let me focus on two broad areas. One, why this is an important topic and second, in terms of focus on the current juncture as where we are now. Why is this an important topic? Let me highlight maybe three different facets. Uh, first, since 2008, Britain and most Western economies have relied on cheap money. And cheap money has been at the root cause of our economic, financial, and political problems. Cheap money led to asset price inflation, including rampant property prices. Obviously, building houses is important, but cheap money was at the core of the problem, which is, in my view, leading to lots of intergenerational strife. Cheap money led markets to not price properly for risk. Cheap money led to a misallocation of resources. Zombie companies remained in business. Growth companies found it hard to access finance. And cheap money led to the recent spike, or one of was one of the factors leading to the recent spike of inflation. So that's the first reason why we need to be focusing very much on this topic about whether the bank's fit for purpose. A second aspect of why we should focus on this, and it's such an important topic, is something Lord Frost touched on. Any time anyone raises criticism about the Bank of England, it's seen by a group of people, including the bank, it has to be said, as an attack on its independence and its integrity. But criticizing the bank is not about challenging its integrity or independence. It's about questioning its credibility and its competence. And indeed, the fact that we've seen the problems we have in recent years makes this center stage. And it's right that there is a review of the bank, albeit only of its model taking place. The review should be about three Ps, about the people, how they're elected or appointed, it should be about the policies, and it should be about the process. But another reason why this debate is so important is because Britain is a low growth, low productivity, low wage economy. Before 2008, it took 32 years for this economy to double in size. On its current
trend, it, the economy will take 70 years to double in size in real terms. That's the reality check since 2008. Since then, we've also become a high tax and high government spending economy as well. Now, it's not recent, it's been there since 2008. It's not unique to us, it's true of Western Europe. Indeed, in 25 years' time, in my view, not only will Britain be the biggest economy in Western Europe, but Western Europe collectively will be smaller in economic size than, for instance, India. Western Europe faces a problem it doesn't want to dress up to. But the point is that we need to have a pro-growth agenda, and that pro-growth agenda has to have, as part of it, monetary and financial stability. That pro-growth agenda also needs to address an important aspect of infrastructure that we never talk about. Infrastructure is not only about hard infrastructure, whether you build HS2, for instance, it's not only about soft infrastructure, about the fact that we need to educate and train our workforce, it's also about institutional infrastructure. And the institutional infrastructure, this is not about saying there's a blob, criticism of Whitehall, I don't buy into that. But in economic terms, it's about genuinely raising questions about the role of the Treasury and of the Bank of England. So I think this is a key debate that needs to be addressed. The second broad area is about the current juncture. Uh, well, the economic fortunes of a Conservative government will be heavily influenced by how the bank has performed over the term of this Parliament. The bank was slow off the mark to curb inflation, and there's every likelihood it will overdo it and growth will be hit hard. So when people go to vote in 12, 18 months' time, they'll be thinking, well, the first three years of this Tory government, they had high inflation. Last six months, they've had pretty weak growth. My God. Um, so it does matter how people vote. But in terms of this inflation cycle, um, look, you've got to give leeway when the pandemic hit in 2020. No one really knew what was happening. So I think it is unfair to criticize institutions for what they did when the pandemic immediately hit. But if we take the Bank of England, by early 2021, it was pretty clear what was happening. I take February 2021 as a key month. Then inflation was 0.7. It had been 0.2 the previous August, but then the economy had been shut down. But in February 2021, it was 0.7. Every forecaster had it going one way up. It was only two months later, indeed, it went above the inflation target. Um, the economy was being unlocked, and everyone, therefore, was agreed it was about to rebound. And therefore, you had a combination of factors that suggested that we no longer needed emergency monetary policy. What did the bank do? It kept interest rates at emergency level, 0.1%. Not only that, um, I'm on the board of two companies in the city. Both companies received letters from the Bank of England, not saying that interest rates were going to go negative, but just saying, make sure that your systems can cope were it the case that we had to have negative interest rates. Now, it wasn't forward guidance, but it was reflecting the mood sink in Threadneedle Street. As inflation began to rise further through the year, the bank continued not only with emergency interest rates, but with quantitative easing. Quantitative easing has been a real problem. And maybe the concluding comment would be that QE after the global financial crisis was good. The demand shock we had then led to the need for QE. We then had 15 or 10 years of QE quantitative easing where the bank bought gilts. That was unnecessary. The quantitative easing we saw as a result of the pandemic was just bad. Simple as that. Because it had worked in 2008, the bank seemed to think it was the right policy, even though, as Mervyn King pointed out, very quickly it became clear that we were in a very different economic environment. It required not quantitative easing, it exacerbated the inflation problem. The inflation problem really was caused both by a supply side shock and by inappropriate monetary policy. Now the bank is actually making up for lost time. Um, monetary policy though works with a long and variable lag and the danger is that we might see the bank overdoing it. So in terms of the current juncture, what the bank has done in terms of not responding quickly enough to the inflation problem to begin with, is now being maybe compounded by possibly the danger of overdoing it 
and seen the economy suffer as a result. So two broad areas, why this is such an important topic, and second, relating to where we are at the moment in the economic cycle. Brilliant, thank you, Gerard. Sue? I don't have too much to add to that very forensic account of what's happened over the past uh, couple of decades. But in a simple answer to the question that's sort of floating above our heads is no, the Bank of England's models at least are not fit for purpose. And the Bank of England has admitted that. That's why they've commissioned Ben Bernanke to review its models, its modelling and its processes. And I think we've come out of a period where central bankers were revered. After the financial crisis, they became the only game in town. There was no money in terms of, uh, in terms of fiscal firepower. So they relied on central banks to slash interest rates. And I think from there stemmed a hubris that I don't think they've shaken since. I mean, at the time, I remember people like George Osborne, Rupert Harris and his advisor were very proud of what they called monetary offsets. So fiscal policy could remain tight while you know, central bankers printed all the money they liked in order to support the economy. But as we came through the pandemic, I think this idea of cheap money, as you put it, Gerard, they, they reached for that lever and they printed too much. It's very clear now um, that they made mistakes. They were behind the curve um, up until very recently. Um, and you can see that e even today. So every three months, I get locked into the basement of the Bank of England, by choice, I must say, for a couple of hours while they publish what's called their monetary policy report, where they, um, it's basically their quarterly health check of the economy. And after that report, and we have a press conference, and we ask the governor questions, there's an economist briefing. And um, I was speaking to a couple of people who attend that economist briefing, you know, and w when inflation was starting to take off and some policymakers, Andy Haldane, Michael Saunders, were saying, you know, you know, should we turn the taps off on QE? Are we starting to see inflation take off? And they put that to the policymakers that, you know, are in this briefing. And the sh short answer was no. You know, they were being asked, oh, what about your models? Do they take into account what happened in the 70s? And they were shut down very quickly. So this idea of hubris, you know, we know better, I think that pervades Threadneedle Street today. And that's why they've had to have um, this external review. Um, and of course, after hubris, if you're fans of Greek mythology, comes Hamathia, you know, and that fatal flaw um, is coming to bear now. And I think with some of the mistakes that we're seeing, um, and hopefully there won't be a repeat of that. Excellent, Sue, thank you very much. Thank you to all the panel. Um, there's an awful lot there that we could dig into more, I think. Um, I want to start with this question, David, you raised it first, about the taboo of criticizing independent institutions. And actually maybe even broaden that question out a little bit. Um, it's really striking the degree to which politicians, by and large, do not consider or talk about these issues, or at least until very recently, they didn't. Um, it's almost as though making the Bank of England independent uh, led politicians to think, and this is therefore something we must never talk about again. Mm. And obviously, I think a degree of understanding um, and comfort with the issues has, has disappeared over time as well, so that maybe people don't have the, the intellectual framework and the vocabulary to talk about it. Is that why financial markets, people more broadly, seem to overreact so much to some fairly mild criticisms, I thought, of the Bank of England um, by people associated with the incoming Liz Truss regime? Because I can remember talking to people who worked in the city and so on um, at the time, and they were saying, that, you know, these people are scary. What crazy things are they going to do to the Bank of England? I said, you know, the Bank of England has let inflation get out of control. Why shouldn't politicians be talking about it? Actually, uh, if the Bank of England's current operating framework has failed, couldn't we consider another one, even with them remaining independent? But somehow, we got into this position where to even question the Bank of England seemed somehow inappropriate. Um, and it probably did feed into some of that financial market panic that we saw around a year ago. What's happened? <laughs> I, I mean, I think um, it's obvious. I, I think the way you describe it is, is correct. Mm -hmm. I think there has been a progressive loss of expertise and comfort in kind of talking about it generally. Um, I do think, though, that there's a particular problem in the UK, and it's connected with 
Brexit, that um, this view that the so much of the economic and political establishment hold that um, uh, Brexit governments are hopelessly populist, you know, enjoy kicking around independent institutions, have no regard for the careful checks and balances of the way the uh, financial system and the, uh, the British constitution work. I think that's made, uh, has had the result that the, the, the financial establishment sort of exaggerates everything that's said. They're excessively nervous of uh, what, in my view, which is normal, uh, political and economic debate. And um, I think some of that was um, you know, deliberately played up and deliberately made to sound more alarmist than it really was in all the noise uh, around the trust government and the drama that, that went with it. So I think until the establishment, until the economic and financial establishment gets used to the idea of Brexit and what came with it and what it means for how we run the country, we're always going to have some of this nervousness there. I mean, George, you've worked in the city for, for many years. How would, how would you approach trying to reform the Bank of England, maybe trying to reform monetary policy in light of the failures that have happened over the last couple of years or maybe, maybe over a longer period based on your remarks um, without spooking financial markets again? Yeah, your, your question was uh, trying to combine, it seemed to me, both a general point that was vitally important about the need to hold institutions to account and specific circumstances that, to be quite frank, even at the time were badly handled. Yeah. Uh, when you start um, criticising not just the bank, it was other institutions as well, let's be quite mm. frank, um, including the OBR and the idea that, to use the phrase I used publicly at the time, no one marking your homework. So <laughs> the, the point is that you can't, you need to take the markets with you. Um, and if the market's focus is in a certain place, you need to take that on board and you need to explain your narrative and your thinking and you need to win the debate. Now, it's very difficult to make change in... The irony is this, when things are going well, people don't want to change. And when things are going badly, people think it's not the time to change. And that's the real issue. What we saw last year was an inflation problem and the inflation problem, um, if we get to the root cause of it, was a combination of supply side factors and lax monetary policy. The challenge in the UK last year was that we seemed to have a combination of US and European inflation together. In the US, the inflation was very much explained by an overheating domestic economy where President Biden had a relaxed fiscal policy on top of a pretty lax monetary policy. The European inflation problem was a lot more supply side linked with the energy crisis on top. Britain was somewhere there in the middle. What was clearly needed was a rebalancing of policy, a tighter monetary policy, a fiscal policy that was focused on the supply side. So coming back to your question, um, you can change, but you need to have a clear vision, longer term thinking, and you need to make it relevant for the particular circumstances at the time. When the bank was made independent, most people aren't aware there was an active debate then. Um, and Barrow, a very famous economist, had written a paper in the Bank of England quarterly bulletin the year before, um, pointing out that history showed that of central banks that were independent, you can't blame low inflation, attribute low inflation to the independence of the central bank. It was often a third factor. And this is fast forward to where we are now. When the Bank of England celebrated its 25th anniversary, um, everyone was saying, well, it's done a great job because inflation was low. Mm. Um, but global factors had played their part. So much so in the city, the joke was the consumer price index, the CPI, could be renamed the China price index. Yeah. So the bank took the credit for what were global factors. And then as inflation let rip, mm. the bank was very keen to blame global factors. You can't play it both ways. Um, so, but coming back to your question, you need to have a clearly thought out policy. If you do shock the markets though, as Gordon Brown showed in 97, you need to shock them in a way in which it goes in the direction that the markets want to hear. So a surprise then was the bank being made independent for monetary policy. The negative, as Eddie George, the then governor pointed out, was about the regulatory side, but that was a different issue. So if you do shock the markets, 
expect a reaction, but if you are going to shock them, shock them on the way in which their current thinking is. You've got to handle this very carefully and really know what you're doing is uh, the message I'm getting there. Yeah, and you need to build a narrative, uh, which is, to be quite frank, the Labour Party has spent the last two years courting the city. It's exactly the same as John Smith did. I remember me as a very young city scribbler meeting <laughs> John Smith then in whichever decade it was, in the 90s. He spent two years courting the city um, to say Labour was this, that and the other. So you do need to work at it. And if the Conservatives have spooked the markets, as they have done, the challenge is it's not just the domestic market. We live in international capital markets. And because of quantitative easing, the maturity of our debt, as came out at a CPS event recently, has gone from seven years to two years. We now have the second highest amount of government bonds in the G7 bought by foreigners, second only to France. Um, and that's gone up from 13 to 20, 23, 24, 25%. The Bank of England, on top of that, is the biggest holder of gilts. So we have a situation where you have to be sensitive that higher interest rates add to your debt burden, higher bond yields add to your debt burden. You don't want the risk premium factored into your uh, debt, and you need to keep foreigners on side. So it's the international markets, not just the domestic market, is key. Sue, so a question for you as a, a journalist. Um, one, of the, one of the interesting developments, I suppose, in monetary policy over the last decade or so, you know, you always used to think of it, it's about monetary aggregates or it's about interest rates or whatever. It seemed like central banking became a lot to do with communications um, and forward guidance and what central bankers said, people would hang on every word and, you know, hugely overinterpret. But I think there was this idea that uh, if a central banker said something, and it was believed, it would become so. Uh, but that obviously requires a sort of degree of clarity and skillful communications, which maybe has gone missing. I mean, when you cover these stories, do you feel like the quality of the communication from the Bank of England has degraded a little bit? So I started covering the Bank of England uh, in about 2013 when Mark Carney took it. He was the high priest of forward guidance. So he had this thing, I think it was called conditional commitment over in Canada, which worked. And he basically said, after the financial crisis, we would keep interest rates low for X amount of time. And he brought it over to the UK. And I think one of his first things that he said is we would not even think about uh, raising interest rates until unemployment fell to 7%. It was eight point something percent at the time, and their forecasts suggested it might not fall to seven percent within three years. Of course, it fell to seven percent within months. Um, we criticised him; he didn't like it, and it pretty much continued that way through his um, eight-year tenure. But in answer to your question, yes, I think as part of that hubris, as I said right at the beginning, central bankers have come to think that they can predict what's going to happen. And, and I guess markets have come to, you know, see them as fortune tellers, as it were, to, you know, any, we had the, you know, the time of Trichet even, where, you know, code words that um, Jean-Claude Trichet, who was the head of the European Central Bank, um, more than a decade ago, he used to use words and people used to interpret that as, oh, they're going to raise rates or, 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 or cut them. But they've become so specific and so arrogant almost that, you know, when they get it wrong, of course they should own it because these are the people who are making these um, assumptions. And I think, you know, there's a lot to be said of, I, I interviewed Lord King recently and he said sometimes the best approach is we don't know <laughs> what's going to happen. And what we could say is, you know, here is the outlook at the moment, here's what's on the table, here are the options rather than we will do this. Um, and, and often, you know, the economy has proven the bank wrong. I mean, last November they predicted an eight-quarter recession. We've had no recession. And I think in that sense, the Bank of England was too gloomy. And yes, it is the Bank of England's job to make forecasts. It has to, you know, um, nail its colours to the mast somehow. But there are, sometimes there is a bit of an arrogance to the Bank of England's forecast that I think it needs to shake. That, that, that forecast last year was quite um, exceptional. It was the first time the Bank of England had ever forecast a recession before the consensus. So they really put their, they went out on a limb. And then as you, 
it was a shallow recession they were predicting, as they now remind us, but they said it was eight quarters, and we shouldn't forget it had a major impact on sentiment at the time. Mm. So I think they need to be more mindful, because they, as you correctly point out, they really drive how yeah. people react in investment. Absolutely. Mm. Let's go in a slightly less technical direction for a minute, I guess. Um, I'm interested about the impact of inflation on our politics and our political debate. Um, obviously, it was a defining issue in the 70s, and, and in a way, it birthed Thatcherism. I mean, I suppose when Thatcherism started, it was mostly called monetarism, um, and there was a, a clue in the name there. Do you, do, David, do you see any kind of response building out of the kind of inflation we've had over the last couple of years? I think um, my colleague Rob Colville cited some studies in the last, uh, last session, you know, suggesting that actually inflation had made people want more government in a way that they hadn't before. They wanted government to tell companies what to do. They wanted government to fix prices and everything else. I mean, there are lots of things wrapped up in that, the pandemic and the energy price guarantee and, and, and everything. But as a politician, what impact do you think this is going to have on our political debate and maybe also the future of the direction of conservatism? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, I guess there definitely has been a shift according to the polling of um, uh, towards a wish for more government. I'm not sure that inflation has played a, more than a minor part in that myself. I think it's, it's more the events of the last couple of decades, the, um, uh, the crash, the, co the, uh, the pandemic, and I think the general sense that things like net zero create, which is that a lot of important economic policy making is amenable to government direction, and that things that we were once willing to leave to the market are now, uh, should now be controlled by government in a way. And I think all these things have come together over a couple of decades, uh, unfortunately, and it's going to take some, some pushing back on. I, I, I mean, in terms of conservatism, there's a debate going on, clearly, between uh, the sort of true believers in markets and the, um, the kind of Joseph Chamberlain version of conservatism, the sort of statist, mm. uh, slightly protectionist view of conservatism. And I personally hope the first wins, obviously, because I think the track record of that is much better in actually delivering growth. But I, it feels like that argument is around now, and it's a product of the um, undynamic, um, low productivity, low innovation, economy we've lived through uh, mm. over the last 20 years. And, and actually, just, just to finish one sort of reaction to what you were saying earlier, which is, you know, we do need a shake up in the real economy to get growth again, uh, and a very significant one, I think. But that is in itself going to cause quite a lot of disruption, and it's going to scare the bank, it will scare the markets if it's not very, very well explained. So there's a bit of the things the bank is actually more comfortable with the rather undynamic, uh, simple monetary policy environment we've had uh, over the last few years and would be uncomfortable with the sort of deregulatory, more untrammeled capitalism, which is actually what we need to get us out of this hole. Gerald, I mean, I, I hate to ask you to gaze into the crystal ball. But I wonder, you know, I think that the, the sentiment generally now is that the era of ultra low interest rates is over. Um, we're going to yeah. shift to a, a kind of a completely different mode of monetary policy than what we've had since 2008. Um, do, you, do you agree with that? Do you think things really have changed? Um, or, you know, the next time we have a recession or a crisis, are things going to snap back to how they were uh, for that? that decade after the financial crisis and more? Okay, um, I think things have changed, but um, what's not clear yet is whether central banking thinking has changed. By that I mean uh, central bankers in the Western world gather each year at Jackson Hole in Wyoming, and in the major gathering just before pandemic, they talked about our star technical term, R, st R with the star. So it's policy rates in real terms after allowing for inflation. And the conclusion was that R star was close to zero in America, Britain, Germany, and uh, Japan. Uh, what that meant, if inflation was 2%, then interest rates should be 2%. If inflation was zero, interest rates should be zero. 
inflation was 3%, interest rates should be 3%. And their argument was because aging populations, older people save more, um, and productivity will be slower. This is the reason why interest rates fundamentally are lower, and therefore we should get used to it. I think partly because they didn't anticipate inflation, um, they're now rethinking, but they haven't really maybe rethought as much as they should have done. Um, I think headline inflation, well, headline inflation has already fallen sharply in Britain and Western economies. It peaked last October at 11.1%, 6.7% now. It could easily be down to, well, easily is probably a dangerous word to say. <laughs> uh, it could go down below 2% this time next year. Uh, so if you're thinking of having an election, that might help. Um, core inflation, which takes out volatile elements, is proving stubbornly high, it, particularly in the euro area, where it's been above 5% since last October. So it's not just Britain. Basically, um, wages did not cause this spike in inflation. It was supply side and it was monetary. But workers are naturally trying to catch up. Companies are passing on higher costs. So it's unclear where core inflation settles. But in the last 25 years, four global factors kept inflation low. Two of those global factors have changed. The four global factors were globalization, wage share being squeezed lower because of globalization, technological change, and what's called financialization, companies keeping their accounts in check to keep the markets on side. Technology and financialization are still there. AI is coming along around the corner. But globalization has been replaced by fragmentation. Companies are onshoring. Um, and in turn, not a bad thing, wage share is now rising. But what that means is that inflation in the past was 1% to 2%. In all likelihood, it will settle somewhere higher. We don't know yet, mm. hence Sue's point about saying you don't know. It could be 2 to 3%. My guess a year and a half, two and a half years ago, was it was going to settle nearer 3 to 4%. If you get in that environment, then you need to have positive real interest rates. You need to have interest rates above inflation. So if inflation is, say, 3% in two years' time, then we should be having interest rates at 4.5%. That changes the dynamic. Mm. And at the Bank of England, they, it's not just monetary policy where we're focusing, but they did make lots of rules and regulations linked to the housing market, which impacted people's ability to borrow. Mm. They might have genuinely said this was for financial stability reasons, but there are consequences in terms of people's access to finance as well. Understood, all right. I think it's probably time to turn to the audience and take some questions. A few hands going up already. Uh, colleagues, we'll start with the gentleman here. Joe, if you can bring the microphone down. Uh, thanks very much. Pete Bradbury, uh, Chairman of Sussex Conservatives. And, and thank you for some very interesting observations, which illuminating for me as a non-economist, I must say. But, um, so, so my question, and it may be a question you don't want to answer actually, but my <laughs> question is, uh, in, in any organisation, large or small, generally speaking, the success and progress of that organisation is linked to the quality of the leadership. I think in, the, uh, you talked about uh, Eddie George and Mervyn King, and just from chatting with people, like, they, they seem to inspire more public confidence than the, the, the latter two, uh, Mark Carney and, and Andrew Bailey. So, is it that the not that the bank's not fit for purpose, but the current leadership is? <laughs> Does anyone uh, feel that they can they can answer that question without getting in trouble? I think it's a well. I made my comments about um, uh, Ed George and Mervyn King at the start, and contrast. You can actually say whatever you want right now. <laughs> yeah. It's going to be out of the way. <laughs> I do think there's been a contrast between the first the sort of decade or so and the subsequent period. I do think. I mean, I don't want to get into individuals because I don't. I don't know them at all well. But I do think that. Um, the bank is in need, or will be in need, of um, somebody who um, 
is it intellectually in command of the arguments and has confidence in the city amongst politicians that perhaps it lacks at the moment? I think that's yeah. probably where I am. Yeah, um, it, it, they do have a difficult job, so yeah. we have to give them some slack. Yeah. The point that's often raised without going into the personalities is about how people are appointed. Because the, uh, the Treasury uh, basically oversees the appointment, the man of all people at the bank. So the mandarins recommend to the chancellor who should be governor. Um, the four deputy governors now have all at time, worked, in previous times, worked in the treasury. And the argument, and the, the treasury oversees every committee that appoints an outside member. Now, I'm not critical of the individuals at treasury, but often people say that's an issue and the danger is groupthink. Yeah. Now, we are starting to see more diverse thinking at the bank. Um, lady from the other sea, I think is a great economist, has a completely different view to me on many things, but I read all her stuff. So I think we're now starting to see some diversity being brought in. So I think there is more sensitivity to this issue without getting into the question of individual personalities. But you're right, leadership is key. Can we just take another question right here, please? Tony Barr was the Chancellor of the Exchequer in 1970, and he alone actually created a demand for inflation. He made money available to buy houses, much greater amount than should ever have been given to people. House prices doubled during three years, or less than three years. We then had a crash in 1974. We read all about minor strikes, the problem that Edward Heath had. By January 1975, the stock market had crashed as well. It's over 7,000 at the moment. In January 1975, it was 150. We had to go cap in hand to the IMF. We asked for 10 billion. We didn't really know how much we wanted. And when they actually worked it out, we only needed 8 billion. I think Sir Jim Callaghan got the poison chalice, really. He could never have got that round. It was a total mess. And then Maggie Thatcher came in. So it seems to me there's two types of inflation. Demand pull, which we should have avoided or could have avoided, and then we've got cost plus. At the moment, the moment we've got cost plus, and it costs plus. And it's the demands of workers now that can see prices rising everywhere, so they want more money. But that just adds and adds and adds to, in, to inflation. It had to be stopped. The only way to avoid it, effectively, is not to give the pay increases, but don't let anybody suffer. And eventually, it comes out of the system. The other point which might be relevant to this is, um, if you think about it, the European Central Bank actually had negative interest rates. Mm. And that must have influenced interest rates in this country. Thank you. Cost push inflation? I mean, should we be worrying about the labor market? Um, obviously, the traditional monetarist view would be no, unless you're you know, financing. Um, those demands with new money, it's not a problem, but then there is, there is another view that the labor market is a yeah. big issue here. Yeah, uh, yes. Well, the Barber period was interesting because Britain since 1969 has, I think, only had seven years when it's had a budget surplus. 69, 70, and 70, 71, as a legacy of Roy Jenkins, we had a budget surplus. <laughs> and then uh, Barber came in with Ted Heath and decided to put the foot on the accelerator. And you're right. Um, and then it coincided with a supply shock as well with the oil OPEC crisis as well. But what we, this round of inflation or this sequence of inflation, the first round inflation was supply side factors and inappropriate monetary policy. Now the supply side factors have been reversed because the pandemic is over, transportation costs are low, and monetary policy is tight. And it's not just interest rates, quantitative tightening is continuing even when interest rates are likely to have peaked. And the Treasury is gonna to have to be basically giving taxpayers money to the asset purchase facility as we uh, give money to the commercial banks. But the second round inflation is where the focus is, which is people catching up and companies catching up. So yeah, this inflation was not caused by workers, but workers are naturally trying to uh, make up for it. I see quite a lot of people with questions, so maybe if we can bundle a couple together at a time. There's two gentlemen there on the left-hand side, and we'll work our way back. I'm, I can see other people, don't worry. Uh, Howard Thompson, Chairman of the Conservative Policy Forum. I'm sorry, he, I read a book apparently recently called Planet Ponzi, where they analysed corporate co profitability in the United States between around 28 and when it published a couple, only a couple of years ago. 
Looking at the increase in proportion of profit, profits in the US, US going to Wall Street, by banking, rose from about 10% to about 45%. But what, I can't remember the exact figures, but it was really, really substantial. To what, so to what extent to the fact that uh, profitability in Main Street has fallen as a result, does that contribute to our lack of um, uh, growth and, and, and you know, performance, etc., etc.? Mm. Thank you. And just behind you. Uh, my name is Brian Weller. And I was just wondering, from last year's uh, mini budget, uh, the real problem for the Bank of England was that they were trying to break the inextricable link between the growth of the money supply, creation of debt, and more GDP. How much are they totally inextricably linked, and how do we cure the problem? Thank you. Um, So, I mean, do you buy that story about the kind of the shifts in corporate America and probably corporate Britain as well, that financialization, um, you know, financial services taking a much larger share of the economy has been driven by monetary policy and things the central bank has done? Um, I don't know is, is the short answer. I, I don't know either. That's why book. I asked. Yeah. <laughs> I will. Um, I'm not sure I have an opinion on, oh, on, on that. Um, what, uh, others? Well, I would say uh, one of the opening comments I made was that cheap money uh, did lead markets to not price properly for risk. And I think that's a reflection of this. Um, one has to say parts of the US economy have been phenomenal. Um, the Silicon Valley, we think of it as seven companies, but it's a whole infrastructure of 700 companies, really. The, the Silicon Valley is at the forefront of technological change. So parts of the US economy are doing phenomenally well, but you're correct. And the challenge is that as we move from cheap money to policy normalization, um, Warren Buffett used the phrase many years ago, is only when the tide's out you can see who's swimming naked. And as interest rates go up, it exposes problems. The LDI crisis last autumn was an accident waiting to happen, exacerbated by the speed at which market interest rates moved up. Um, the shadow banking problem in the States earlier this year was an accident waiting to happen. The worry is, where's the next one? Half, what's fascinating is that in 2008, because banks were at the center of the system, after the global financial crisis, regulations were tightened on banks, but someone else stepped in, the shadow banking industry. And the Financial Stability Board does an annual assessment of the shadow banking industry. So the latest data is from two years ago. But global financial assets are about $475 trillion. It's so big. Half of that is now accounted for by the shadow banking industry. And at their core, whereas banks would have collateral linked to housing, I'm, I'm talking in very general terms here, so that we could spend an hour talking this, but at their core, they will have government bonds as their key risk-free asset. And we now have government bonds, which in the pandemic, 40% of the government bonds globally were negative yields. So governments were being paid to borrow. Britain could have borrowed longer term and seen the benefits of that, but we didn't do that as we should have done. Government bonds have lost money for three years. So the problem is that as you move from cheap to normalization, all these issues that you've touched on come to the fore. And it could be corporate problems in the States, distressed debt, uh, problems elsewhere. But you need to have policy normalization and help, as the gentleman said at the front, helping people out in that interim phase. We have 11 minutes, not another hour, unfortunately. <laughs> I think we've, we probably could keep going. But just to recast the other question, um, David, are we stuck in a trap where basically growth requires debt and debt requires cheap money, and that's the central bank's job? Has that been <laughs> our economic paradigm? And does that really need to shift now? And I, can it shift? It does need shift, I think, um, and, but I'm not sure how we get it to shift. Mm. Um, I, my worry is that we talk about normalization of interest rates, but my worry is actually the economy cannot stand 
uh, either here or in the Eurozone, cannot stand normalization of, of interest rates. And I, to be honest, I think some of these arguments that zero or close to zero real rates are about right because of the yeah. aging population, I, I suspect uh, they are an intellectual rationalization of the fact that the economy can't stand more than zero real interest rates, then, then, then they are really correct. So my worry is that if we do try normalization for any period of time, uh, the economy will go into a recession. We will then go down into a further crisis, a further round of super low interest rates. The economy gets even less dynamic, even lower productivity, and um, another crisis may not be far off. So I, my worry is I don't see how we normalize without the kind of reform to the growth capacity of the economy that just seems impossible to achieve at the moment. So that's the trap we're in. So anything you want to come in on? No, just uh, as Gerald said, that you know, d during the era of cheap money, there, there was a lot of money washing around, and yeah. it, a lot of it found itself in non-conventional places like money market funds. And there are trillions of dollars uh, around the world that we just know, and accidents can happen, as yeah. we've seen, yeah. you know, with the LDI, with um, for other reasons as well um, as um, vulnerabilities come to the surface. And I, I don't think we've seen the end of it. We shouldn't be too pessimistic. The global economy is really still growing. Mm. The challenge for us is that most of that growth is in the Indo-Pacific, which is India in the west to America in the east. It's not in Britain or on our doorstep. Yeah. And that's the challenge. That's why we need to become more competitive. There we are. Um, everyone who wants to ask a question in the next nine minutes, put your hand up so I've got a sense of Okay, well these are gonna to have to be really short questions. I'll try and get through as many as we can. Take them in groups of three. Um, so Jack, if you wanna take a few at the back and we'll work forwards a little bit as well now. I don't wanna, um, so this chap's got a microphone already. Uh, to the panel, uh, you mentioned the fact that, it, that uh, the bank needs to change and a review is being conducted. Do you see uh, a mechanism in which if a governor is not performing, that governor can be removed from office? Good question. Uh, gentleman here next to you, yes. Is one of the difficulties for the Bank of England at the moment that all the time it is settling monetary policy, that there is this relentless growth of public sector employment through misguided inflation leading to expanded compliance departments, and personnel departments, and none of which have a productive role. Thank you, and then, yes, right there. Yeah, very quickly, um, talking about asset price, I'm re reminded of the, the fight that Mervyn King had uh, when he wanted to call the housing market, and, you know, generally speaking, should we be more focused on asset prices mm. when we set uh, interest rate levels? Um, and the other thing, very quickly, is is Ben Bernanke honestly the best person <laughs> to hold the room? All right, great questions. Um, so the three, accountability at the Bank of England, and you know, in extremists, do you need to remove a governor if he's not doing his job? Um, can you actually have good rational monetary policy with a massive and growing state, or is the pressure always going to be on the central banker to accommodate? The government's fiscal demands, um, and finally, you know, should we be looking more at asset prices? You can comment on Ben Bernanke if you want to. Um, why don't we? Why don't we go along? I mean, Sue, do you want to pick up any point you want there? So, um, just on the technicalities of can the Bank of England governor be fired? So, as I understand it, the way the Bank of England governor used to be appointed, it used to be two five-year terms. I think George Osborne wanted Carney to do one eight-year term, which he said he'll do five, and then he extended twice. So there is no mechanism for him to be fired, but I suppose if the Prime Minister, um, the Chancellor said they did not have you know, faith in him, they did not com have confidence in him, he'd have to go. But I think the problem is a lot deeper than Andrew Bailey. I mean, this is an institution that fundamentally, I still think after this review is published, we'll still say 
we get it right and we have you know most of the time we we do get it right and these are unprecedented times and we had a war in ukraine and you know we had an energy price shock and these were all external forces we couldn't do anything about it i think it's up to people like me to scrutinize that and obviously you know um People may have opinions of Ben Bernanke, who's one of the architects of QE uh, Mark One or 1.0. Um, but this review, it's a good thing that it's happening. He's coming, he's flying over from um, the States to, to observe what's going on in the bank for November. And we'll see what he says. Um, but this should be an ongoing process, not a review that gets get published and then it gets put on a, a grand shelf at, at the Bank of England, never to be read again. That's the important thing. Yeah, uh, the second question about public sector employment, regulatory overkill. Yeah, um, it's fascinating in the city to see how the regulatory pendulum has swung from pre-2008, it was at one extreme, self-regulation. If anything, it's gone to the other extreme and needs to settle in the middle. Um, one, there's been so many consultations in the last two years. This government almost had a you could say policy of benign neglect to the city up until two years ago for um, genuine reasons. It thought the city could look after itself and then it realized it needed to help. But the important point is that these consultations are going really well. I think the city minister Griffiths is doing a great job. Uh, but one thing is that the Hills report and the Western on listings um, propose regulators have a secondary objective which is competitiveness. Obviously, you shouldn't give regulators too many things because they should need to be focused. But I think it, people are now mindful of the fact that regulatory burden is so high. In terms of the third point, asset price inflation, well, the bank's objective is 2% uh, inflation and subject to that government's economic policy. Over next year, the Bank of England will be telling us that they've hit their objective. I think inflation looks set to significantly decline. Where it then settles the following year remains to be seen. But I think the important point, the question is about asset price inflation. Um, I'm not a monetarist, but I find it perplexing that in the quarterly monetary policy review, the bank never mentions the word money. The thing is, they have two and a half thousand people looking at inflation. They should be overall aspect of this. A year ago, before the Treasury Select Committee, two of the members of the, or well, the governor and one of the deputy governors were there, and they were asked a question about people coming off fixed rate mortgages. Uh, they should have had the data in front of them. They should have known it. Mm. Uh, it requires Reuters to provide the data. Uh, same thing six months ago, Resolution Foundation. I'm not saying that they should be more focused on something than the other thing, but if reducing inflation is your objective, you should know every single aspect about it. Absolutely. We have to give them some slack because this is difficult. Um, inflation is impacted by many things, uh, but they need to be on top of where all the potential problems are. Uh, well, just quickly, um, on this question of uh, can the governor be fired, it seems, I don't know, I, this is probably a very controversial thing, but I think the Prime Minister should be able to fire the governor of the Bank of England, and it's extraordinary to me that he or she can't. I, I, I had thought, well, you thought so, but then I thought, suppose Liz Truss had last autumn said she didn't have confidence in the governor, would he have gone? I'm not sure in those circumstances. And then you'd have had a real problem. So I think it's better to have um, uh, a formal thing that is understood that there are checks and balances around him, but, but I, it seems strange to me that it's actually impossible. Yes. Um, public sector, I mean, productivity seems to be falling fast in the public sector in, for reasons that I think people don't quite understand uh, are anecdotal, but it's obviously a big part of the, the wider productivity problem that we've been talking about. And asset prices, well, my simple view of this is that if rates are too low for the real economy, as it were, you'll get asset price inflation, and if interest rates are normal for the real economy, then as you said, you get a recession and an asset price crash. So in a way, the, our problem, the problem we've got into is that interest rates are too low and too high at the same time, and I don't know how we dig ourselves out of this. Well, on that cheery note, I'm very sorry to say that we have to wrap up. We've got to turn this room around very quickly. Um, thank you all for coming and joining what I think has been a really interesting discussion, and please join me in thanking our panel.